Lightsaber Loop. My name is Lex, and I'm here to keep you in the loop of everything RBT the BCBA. So, what we were last going over, which was the RBT task list breakdown, we're going to go over the sections of D through F. If you haven't already, go on and like, subscribe, and comment on the videos. It's really helpful for me to be able to keep these videos going, um, and hopefully, they're helping you guys through your studying, or if you're already in RBT, keeping you up to date with the RBT task list. As you can see here, you can see all the sections. It is a lot, but this is the final of the RBT task list. So buckle in, here we go. So the first thing I wanna start with is D1, which is behavior reduction plan. So every behavior reduction plan must clearly identify replacement behavior. So it's not enough to say that we want to stop it. We also need to provide an alternative behavior that can be reinforced. Positive reinforcement is always a key part of an effective plan. So that's all of that. Then we have D2, which is our functions of behavior. So all behaviors serve a purpose. We usually think of four main functions. So we have our sensory or automatic reinforcement, our escape or avoidance, our attention or and tangible. So with the sensory, which is our automatic, is behavior provides its own reinforcement. So whatever feels good. So it's not learned, it's just an instant gratification, right? So a child rocks back and forth because it's calming. That is a automatic or sensory function of behavior. Then we have escape and avoidance, which a behavior removes or postpones something unpleasant. So a student pretends to be sick to avoid a math test. And then we have attention, which is behavior gains social interaction, so positive or negative. So an example of this would be a child shouts in class to make peers laugh. And then tangible or access, which is our behavior gets a preferred item or activity. So a toddler screams until they get a cookie. So these are our main functions of behavior that we see all the time. So when a behavior happens, there's never just not for no reason whatsoever. There's always a reason and it usually leads to one of these functions of behavior. So antecedent interventions. Antecedent interventions prevent problem behaviors before they start. So we can change motivating operations, which alter the value of a reinforcer, or we can discriminative stimuli to signal when reinforcement is available. So for example, deprivation makes a reinforcer more powerful while satiation makes it less effective. And SD will tell the learner that the reinforcement can be earned if they respond correctly. Differential reinforcement teaches new behaviors while reducing problem ones. So we have our DRO, DRA, and DRI. So our DRO, which is differential reinforcement of other behavior, is we're going to eliminate the target behavior. So we're going to reinforce when the target behavior does not occur during a set interval. So every five minutes, we'd be like, good job, you sat so quietly. Good job. So reinforcing the fact that that behavior did not happen. DRA, which is differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors, is to replace the target behavior. So we want to reinforce a function alternative behavior instead of a problem behavior. So an example is a child is reinforced for raising their hand instead of shouting. So it's an alternative. So instead of going, teacher, 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 we're no longer reinforcing that. What we're reinforcing is if they raise their hand, we, oh my gosh, good job raising your hand. How can I help you? We are going, we are reinforcing that raising the hand and not the shouting. And then we have DRI, which is your differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. So the goal is to replace a target behavior with one that cannot happen at the same time. So we're gonna reinforce sitting. You can't be standing and sitting at the same time. So again, the key differences are DRO, which is to reinforce the absence of behavior, DRA to reinforce a different functional behavior, and a DRI, which is reinforce a behavior that makes a problem behavior impossible. And then we get to extinction. So extinction happens when a behavior no longer produces reinforcement. So over time, the behavior should decrease. We must first understand the functional behavior to use extinction correctly. So one important point is extinction often leads to an extinction burst, where the behavior is temporarily gonna get really, really bad before it improves. Um, if we stop too early, we risk strengthening the behavior instead of weakening it, which is really, really important for extinction. Then we get into crisis and emergency procedures. So when a crisis is happening, it is top priority to make sure your child is safe. When a crisis happens, the priority is safety. So emergencies may include aggression, self-injurious behavior, elopement, and our role as an RVT is to follow trained procedures and keep clients and ourselves safe and alert their supervisor right away. And afterwards, 
every incident must be documented and reported. Um, every clinic or school, they'll have a certain policy on how to go about that. Make sure you are well aware of how to do that and what are the proper steps for whatever setting you are in with your client. Okay, moving on to E, which is documentation and reporting. So for ongoing communications with supervisors, so supervision isn't just about observation. It's ongoing communication. RVTs are expected to meet regularly with their supervisors to share updates, ask questions, review the client's progress. This ensures service stays ethical and effective. And then we get into seeking clinical direction. So if something comes up, don't wait for the next meeting. You need to contact your supervisor as soon as possible. That means that if you have to get a hold of them through email, through phone, through text, whatever your workplace uses to be able to reach your supervisors, you need to let them know ASAP. Remember, your job is to direct that to the BCBA right away. You do not answer those questions because you don't actually know. It is something that needs to be answered by a BCBA. So if a parent ever brings anything up to you, make sure it's immediately told to your BCBA. How you can respond to that if a parent asks you something that you obviously can't answer, just be like, hey, that's a really good point. I'm gonna make sure to bring it up to the BCBA and I'll have her get a hold of you. And then we get into reporting other variables. So sometimes factors outside of the session affect performance. So these might be things like medication changes, illness, lack of sleep, a new environment. We are responsible for documenting and reporting those variables to the BCBA so they have a full picture of when analyzing progress. So how this would look and how you go about this is when you are at drop off for the kid coming in to start their session or whatever setting you're in, I'm going based off a clinic, you would ask the parents like, hey, how did they sleep? Was there any changes that we need to make note of that would change their behavior? Because you can't directly ask them if they're taking medications and things like that. So you can always just ask like, hey, did they sleep well? Did they eat breakfast? Um, is there any changes that have happened that you've seen of their behavior? Is there anything that we should know? And usually that opens up to parents to be like, oh yeah, this happened. But if anything, just make sure you get all the information you possibly can and then let the BCBA know. And then we get to objective session notes. So session notes must always be objective. This means writing what you observe, not your opinion. For example, say the client sat at the table for 10 minutes and completed three tasks instead of saying the client was really lazy today he just was not feeling it he was not just not having a good day that helps nobody so notes should always include who is present what activities were completed and any relevant factors that impact the session a good way of thinking about it is like doing abc data right so you're going to know what the antecedent was so what happened before the behavior B, for behavior, so what was the behavior, and then C, which is your consequence, what happened due to the behavior. And then we get to compliance with legal and workplace requirement. All data and documentation must follow legal and workplace rules. So that includes keeping information secure, confidential, and stored properly. Most records must be kept for at least seven years, but it may be longer depending on the law. And then following the guideline protects clients and keeps services compliant. Now we're into the section of the professional conduct and scope of practice. Now this one doesn't have a lot of slides to it because it is pretty much as it says. So I'm just gonna go through it and explain. So for the first one, which is describe the role of an RBT in supervision. So RBTs are certified professionals in ABA. We implement plans, we collect data, we communicate as needed, and we always work under the supervision of a BCVA. So supervision must cover at least 5% of service hours each month with two face-to-face -face meetings. RBTs also renew certifications yearly with renewal assessments, background checks, and fees. Now, I do want to bring up that there are new requirements happening soon where when RBTs go to renew their certification, it will now be for two years. So make sure that you guys are keeping up with the BACB updates. They send out newsletter so that you guys can see what's going to be happening when 2026 uh, follows through. I know there are going to be a lot of changes, so make sure you are keeping up to date with what your new requirements are. I know there's going to be also CEUs added. I'm not sure when they're going to start getting on and you have to do that, 
but make sure again that you're looking at your BACB website, keeping yourself up to date because there are changes happening soon for 2026 and 2027. Now on to responding to feedback. So feedback is a part of our professional growth. Sometimes it'll be positive reinforcement for things we're doing well. Other times it'll be constructive criticism to correct our errors. The key is how we respond as RBTs. Our supervisors are legally and ethically responsible for the services that we provide. So it is our duty to take feedback seriously and apply it right away. So that means avoiding defensiveness, asking clarifying questions if we're unsure, and showing that we're willing to learn and willing to understand the plan that they have created. And by responding professionally, we not only improve our own skill, but we also help ensure better outcomes for the client because at the end of the day, the only one that matters is the client and if they are getting the help that they need. But what happens if you feel the feedback isn't helpful, clear, or doesn't follow the RBT ethics code? In that situation, the professional response is to respectfully ask for clarifications or examples. So for instance, you might say, can you show me exactly how you would like me to run these procedures so I can make sure I'm doing my job correctly? If feedback continues to feel really vague and consistent or not aligned with best practices, you have the responsibility to seek guidance. So that could mean scheduling a supervision meeting, requesting written feedback for clarity, or bringing concerns to another quad qualified supervisor if needed. So the ethics code requires RBTs to work under effective supervision. So if supervision is inadequate, it's appropriate to raise the concern in a professional manner. So clients service remain ethical and effective. All right, now we're to communication with stakeholders. So as RBTs, we may interact with caregivers, teachers, other professionals who are involved in the client's life, but we must always stay within our own scope. This means that we should share updates, session information, or data collection details only as directed by the BCBA. We cannot make treatment decisions or provide clinical recommendations on our own. If someone asks a question outside of our role, for example, a parent's asking if, you, if we can change the reinforcement system, our responsibility is to let the BCBA know and they will address it. So clear communication with stakeholders while staying within the scope will help build trust and keep the team aligned. And then we get into professional boundaries. So maintaining professional boundaries is one of the most important responsibilities as the RBT. Boundaries keep focus on treatment and protect both the client and the therapist from ethical concerns. So first, we must avoid relationships. That means we don't take on other roles with the client or family, such as being a friend, babysitter, or accepting gifts over $10. Even small gestures like a holiday present can create big conflicts of interest and blur professional lines. Social media is another area where boundaries are really important. We should not follow or friend or message clients or their families. Another piece of maintaining boundaries is respecting cultural obligations as well. So every client and family comes from a unique cultural background that shapes their values, communication styles, and expectations. And as RBTs, we must recognize and honor those differences while staying within our professional role. So for example, in some cultures, it may be customary to offer food or gifts as a sign of respect. While we cannot accept gifts over $10, we can still show cultural sensitivity by politely explaining the policy or expressing gratitude in another way, like thanking them verbally or reminding them that their child's progress is the best gift. Cultural considerations also include how we communicate. Some families may prefer formal communications while others are very casual. Some may emphasize group decision making while others rely on individual parents. Our job is to adapt our professional communication styles to be respectful and effective while still following the BACB ethics code. Now, boundaries are not being distant or cold. Please don't do that. They are about ensuring a professional relationship that protects the client's dignity and respects their culture and keeps the treatment effective. And then at last, we get to our maintaining client dignity. Above all, our role is to treat every client with dignity and respect. That means we never talk about clients in a way that is disrespectful or judgmental. We use professional objective language at all times. Maintaining dignity also means honoring their privacy, giving them choices whenever possible, and recognizing their individuality. For example, instead of treating a client like it's a checklist of behaviors, we see them as a whole person with strengths, preferences, goals, likes, loves, hates. We respect all of it. 
In every interaction, we should ask ourselves, would I want to be treated this way if I were the client? Keep dignity at the center of our practice, which will ensure that the services are compassionate as well as effective. All right, guys, that concludes the RBT task list. I am so excited. I got to finish this with you guys. I hope you like it. Don't forget to subscribe and like and comment. I will be doing mock soon. So hopefully that helps all the RBTs out there or one of the RBTs. I am so excited to get you guys into this field and I hope you have an amazing time. I'll catch you later. <laughs>